so many women, so many mothers find themselves in isolation because they don't admit the uglier truths of their lives. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is novelist Anna Julia Stainsby, author of The Afterpains. It's the story of Rosie, whose grief over the loss of her infant daughter nearly 20 years ago has all but cut her off from her husband and teenage son. And it's about Isara, an immigrant from Honduras raising her daughter in Toronto and trying to keep her out of the grip of a centuries-long curse. Anna Julia Stainsby, welcome to Kobo. Thank you for having me. The first voice we hear in this book is neither Rosie nor Isara. Mm -hmm. Though this character is speaking from a perspective of observing the two of them having an emotional conversation in a parked car in a supermarket parking lot. Can you tell us about the character narrating that chapter? Mm -hmm. So the novel opens up with the perspective of Vivian, who is Rosie's past daughter, who for the past 20 years has been observing her family from um, from an unnamed space um, from which she can just observe. And what she sees, for the most part, is her family grappling with the consequences of not only her death, but of her parents' inability to fully process it. Losing a child is, is an unimaginably difficult thing. Not literally unimaginable. Mm -hmm. You imagined it. That's how we have this book. But we learn through this novel how hard it hit Rosie in the aftermath and how, how that grief never let up. Can you tell me about writing that character, writing, writing this, this long-suffering character, Rosie? Mm -hmm. It's funny. So I half of this novel came to me thinking about Isauda and Mivi first, but it wasn't until I saw a movie called The Other Woman um, starring Natalie Portman, where she plays a mother grieving the loss of a child um, by SIDS. And that pain just seemed so unimaginable to me, even though, again, as you said, like you see these portrayals and yet you can't imagine how that would physically feel. Mm. And this fear also just took me at that same time. And I wasn't pregnant or a parent or um, that wasn't in my near future, but I still couldn't help but think that if I didn't evacuate that fear, that it would haunt me for a really long time. And so in writing Rosie, I was kind of exploring what could be almost a worst case scenario mm. of what could happen if you hold on to grief for that long and if you metabolize that grief, um, you know, alone, without community, far from your homeland and from other women who might actually understand, even if they haven't gone through that experience themselves. Mm -hmm. Vivian, the, the disembodied voice of, of, the, of this lost daughter, uh, is not the only child of, of Rosie and, and her husband, Desmond. There's also Eddie. Um, Eddie is, is in his late teens. Um, and as I said in the intro, the, it's a very troubled relationship. Um, mm -hmm. His mother's kind of out of reach of, of him. Um, can you tell me, can you tell me about Eddie, about this, uh, about this poor boy? Yeah. So Eddie was, um, was, you know, conceived accidentally a few years after Vivian's death. He was not a wanted child. And that's something that he feels from, you know, from very early, probably infancy, um, that there is almost that there's a severance between him and his mother specifically. With his father, I think he understands that there's pain with relation to the loss of um, Desmond's daughter and Eddie's sister. But with Rosie, there's really this, um, you know, ever present feeling that she doesn't want Eddie and she doesn't, you know, love him in the same way that she loves Vivian um, very presently. And so as a teenager, he's not only trying to figure out who he is as a person, as an individual, but who he is in relation to his family. Where does he fit? Because in a lot of ways, he feels like although he is the child that is alive, he was, he is, um, he's an outsider in his own family. And Vivian was actually the child that, that, you know, is more central to the family. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's kind of an astonishingly hard thing to be the the least favored child and not even have the benefit of witnessing your parents yes. favoring a child. Yeah. It's just this it's just this absence. Was he a difficult character to write? It's funny. I actually started by really revolving the story exclusively around Eddie. It was supposed to be in his voice. It was supposed to be about Eddie's story. And slowly, I think, wanting more insight into Rosie and into Desmond, I started playing around with this idea of this all-seeing, all-knowing character, which is Vivian. And I think once I kind of unlocked that voice, the next voice that really came to me was Isaura. And then I went to explore the other mother, Rosie. And ultimately, I just found that the female voices were a lot stronger and really told the story that actually felt like it was at the heart mm -hmm. of the novel. And so then finally added in Nevi's voice and it ended up being, you know, the story of four women, two mothers and two daughters, and of course, you know, the men in their lives as well. Isaura and her daughter, Mivi, um, they're a very different parent-child pair mm -hmm. uh, from Rosie and Eddie. They couldn't be, they couldn't be less different. Uh, they are, they're the mother and daughter that I think we all know of. of there's some, one in our, if we're, if we're not part of that pair ourselves, we know a pair who's mm -hmm. like, they're texting each other. They're like, are they bestie? What's that? What's up with that? Yeah. And, and if you're not, if you're not in it, that can seem really alien. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's actually an observation of that at some point where, where I think Eddie observes that as like, wow. Yeah. What must that be like? Um, tell me about, tell me about that pair, about Isaura and, and Mivi. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of anxiety there and there's loss too. There's grieving as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, Isaura's character was really based off almost a patchwork that I saw in my life of the aunts, the grandmothers, the great grandmothers, um, on my Honduran side. I come from a long line of teenage mothers on that side. That's why the book is really so concerned about teenage pregnancy. It's because mm. I grew up um, really having metabolized the power that the role of motherhood can have over a young woman's life, um, especially when it is, you know, taken on before, you know, before that young woman is ready. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw different women in my family take on that role very differently. Obviously, in Honduras, a lot of women had to leave the country and remit money because they just couldn't afford to feed a child at home. Mm -hmm. And I was just very inspired by the courage of the women that I saw. But that didn't mean that I didn't also see the flaws, the sacrifices that they had to make. Um, I think sometimes we see mothers, teen mothers, um, mothers who are in difficult situations as completely sacrificial and perfect and aspirational. And I think that there are nuances to that. Like we see Isaura question whether or not she should send me back when she ultimately, you know, gets custody of her again. Um, and I think that those are painful truths that we don't always write about because, you know, to mother, I think, especially in North American media or literature, is just all consuming and all sacrificial and all love. And mm. it's not just that. Yeah, this book really pokes at the at the multifaceted um, aspect of, of these parent child relationships. I think also of um, of the of the hurt. I mean, jumping back to uh, to Rosie and Eddie, mm -hmm. um, there's there's hurt there's hurt that's accidental of just of just a child needing something that they can't get from their parent, mm -hmm. and there's hurt that's that's. Uh, I don't want to say premeditated, but it's deliberate. Yeah, it is. It is it's an made to hurt. Out. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's an intention to wound to hurt. Um, that feels like a hard thing to wrestle with to to get to a point where you're creating a character and and realizing the right thing for them to do is actually to act out in a violent way, whether mm -hmm. whether with words or or physically. So tell me about developing that that aspect. Yeah, I did find that quite. Um, Striking the right balance with Rosie was important to me because I think she could have very easily just become a one note evil, you know, character. Um, so I think that really making sure that we saw all the vulnerabilities that she had, all the pain that she's carrying, mm -hmm. um, 
and also the small ways in which she shows love. And we don't necessarily see that um, in, in many ways in the present, but I think in the little sacrifices that she makes when, when push really comes to shove and when her family really needs her to step up, she will. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was difficult to, to strike the right balance and to, to make sure that, that these mothers felt as realistic as possible because um, they are in these really tough situations where we don't necessarily know how we would act. And I think it's quite easy to make judgments when, when we haven't been in those positions. The narration, as you were talking about, um, originally conceiving this as, as being in Eddie's voice, mm -hmm. I'm glad you didn't, my, my uh, shock, shock expression didn't, didn't throw you off. You, you managed to answer it fully because, <laughs> because I was surprised yeah. given that um, these chapters are narrated by, we have, we have Rosie chapters, we have Isauro chapters, we have Mivi chapters, uh, we have Vivian chapters. Um, and uh, the only way we get into Eddie's mind mm -hmm. is, is through his sister. Yes. It's Vivian's chapters where, where Eddie is not an object being observed, but Eddie uh, is a, has, has an interiority. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to. I'd love for you to talk more about that transition from, uh, from, from scrapping a whole book that was in Eddie's voice yeah. and and reworking it this way and and making that decision to to put his interiority in this one particular place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is there was some sense of seeing Eddie through the eyes of his sister that felt quite tender to me, mm -hmm. and I think that in a lot of ways that's what Eddie wants. You know. That's what he craves the most. And so giving that perspective um, to him in, in that way as a writer um, felt really right to me. I have a brother. I'm very lucky to be close with him. And I think that there's just a very special relationship. Even though they haven't grown up together, Vivian has always observed her brother. And she's always seen him as her brother. And in a few instances, although she is not a hyper feeling character, I believe that there's one moment in the book where she does express, you know, a desire to, to be there for him. And I, I just thought that that would also kind of communicate um, some of Ed, Eddie's needs a little bit better than the ones that you see interpreted through his mother or through Mivi. Mm -hmm. And he, he does need to be seen. And, mm -hmm. and that's that's something he he really craves. Um, lurking in the background is Desmond, mm -hmm. um, and and I had to uh, I had to double check uh, that his name was actually in the book <laughs> because I I missed him. I I knew he was there, yeah. but um, uh, he's 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 not just he's not just at the periphery. I think he's. He's trying to stay at the periphery. He's yeah. almost trying to be invisible. Uh, he's got some jobs in this family. He manages Rosie's moods as best he can. Mm -hmm. um, and he tries to keep Eddie from, from harm, whatever that means. Um, but we learn he's been through plenty. Um, he's, he's been through enough that in the absence of, of, of losing a child in, in infancy, uh, his what he's been through would probably be like the the center of gravity in this family. Yeah, but but he like he, uh, I mean it's cancer diagnosis. Um, uh, he has significant surgery that's narrated. It's a it's like a meatloaf or something removed from his body. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a vivid image. But we get this scene where he's looking after himself. He's he's got he's got um, photos of his moles mm -hmm. to keep track of his 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 uh, skin cancer possibly coming back, and it's up to him. And I thought, as you talk about characters seeing each other and who sees each other, Desmond's kind of left to see himself. Yeah. Um, was he also always in the periphery, even with the Eddie version? Or or did he have to get moved out there to make room for the structure of the book as it is? He he did have to get moved a little bit. Um, originally, I did have a little bit more on his backstory. But ultimately, Rosie has such a gravitational pull mm. in the dynamics of their family, that there just is no room to share it with Desmond at that center. And I think in some other sense, Desmond is quite comfortable being at the periphery. 
if not happy, at least comfortable. Mm. He knows what his role is in that family. And it's not at that, you know, hot emotional center. It's kind of cooling off on the sidelines, grabbing his wife, grabbing his son and saying, okay, let's talk about this quietly, you know, in the dark when, you know, maybe we don't have to look each other in the eye because that's not as comfortable. But he needs to be that because there's too much happening at the center. Mm -hmm. I I feel like he's lost, you know, the 20 years since, since Vivian, because he's kind of he's kind of shelved himself Mm -hmm. and given himself over in this way that um, I thought it was really lovely that you, you, you resisted the urge to go too deep into him because, because a way to get across how, how much he's removed himself really is to just, is to just leave him where Mm -hmm. he is. Much of this book hinges on the age of 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. Um, I recall it vaguely for myself think it was weird Mm -hmm. don't think i was amazing to be around um (laughs) eddie eddie hit some nerves with some of the some of the some of his brilliant insights that were like okay captain obvious yeah take it down um what was what was interesting to you about setting this age at the fulcrum of this novel because it comes into play in a bunch of different ways yeah it's really an age i think where you start to make real adult decisions you know, the your early 20s or the end of your teens, you're deciding where you're going to school, what path you you think that you're going to be on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at that age, you really think that that's when you're setting things in stone. Um, and it's also when relationships can start to, I don't know, blossom into more, you know, full-bodied adult relationships. And for Eddie and me, the, I just thought it would be beautiful to see what kind of, what kind of dynamic they could explore together Mm -hmm. at that age when they were both so uncertain about what the future would bring. Um, when they're both really at an age where they're grappling with their identity as again, as people, and then as children and making decisions about where they're going to live, what school they're going to go to um, and who they just want to be in the world. I think that in a story that asks a lot of questions about identity, that felt like the right age to, um, to position the kids at. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's also extremely pertinent for Mivi because Mm -hmm. she carries this curse. Yeah. Tell me about the curse. The curse. Yes. So in Mivi's family, the women have been subjected to a curse for as long as they can remember. Great, 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 great grandmothers. Um, one of the one of Mivi's ancestors was living in La Ciudad Blanca, which is um, it's a it's a real place, but it comes with a lot of legend for sure. And one of those legends in her family was that the the jungle where this this white city. Um, is is contained within was invaded by Spaniards. Spaniards found it, and her one of one of her ancestors essentially was allowed herself to be convinced by a Spaniard to enter the city, promising that he wouldn't take any of the artifacts, um, any of their culture, and of course he did. Seems legit. No, he did. no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this probably happened. <laughs> um, but he did, and ultimately, the spirits of La Ciudad Blanca punished him for taking items out of the city and punished her um, with an unwanted teenage pregnancy, um, you know, after, after sleeping with this man. So this is a curse that continues for centuries, and Mivi is now 19, living in Toronto, some of the women in her family had not believed in the curse, but now that she has been faced with her own teenage pregnancy, sort of against all scientific odds, um, she starts to question whether she, you know, whether she will be able to escape it. Isaura wonders as well. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about, about borders, about, um, about cyclical 
traumas and whether or not those are actually escapable. It's also kind of a one in one out kind of curse. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, there's there's uh, uh, a a baby will come into this world, but but somebody else is is it may have to go out. Yes, yes, the man that the woman loves is that is also the punishment for for both of them. Um, that's a that's a that's a f- kind of I want to say a fun thing. That's a stupid thing to say. <laughs> but I wasn't I wasn't going into this book expecting a curse. Yeah, and I wasn't expecting the curse to factor significantly this way mm-hmm. um and we don't we don't we don't this is not gabriel garcia marquez we're not we're not doing magical realism here uh this this has it this feels like something this is something else um did you have like a model you you were you were thinking of was there was there another writer or book or story or even a film that was like that had that feeling yeah it's funny that you say that about magical realism because i think for a very long time. I, I really pushed against that idea. Yeah. Because I think in a lot of stories that I have heard growing up from my Honduran side, those, you know, legends or tales aren't considered to be magical realism. They're just stories. Yeah. They're just what happened yeah. or what people said happened. And so I think I was just sort of plucking stories that I'd been told as a child, stories that some of them I wasn't supposed to hear that I was just, just sitting at the top of the stairs, best you know? Ones. Yeah, the best ones. And yeah, I, I I don't know that I followed a specific model other than, than the storytelling that I heard and that I really wanted to incorporate. Mm. And I think you kind of see that both in, in, um, in Vivian's narration, where again, the rules aren't explained too much of, you know, where she's watching in from, where she's tuning in from. Um, and then also this curse, it just, it is what it is. Mm, yeah. There are different emotional textures in this book. I wanted to know if you, do you write to find out how characters feel or do you sit down to capture a feeling that you know to be, to be true? I think it probably depends on the character and on the scene. Because sometimes I've gone into, for example, Rosie, I found that I really had to work very diligently and just get the words out to Mm. understand what she was actually feeling because she's such a guarded, closed person. Mm. And even to me, I felt like I really had to work to access her. Whereas I think a character like Isaura, who is a lot more open, I could kind of sit down and say, okay, we're going to talk about her time in New York. And there was an openness where I kind of knew, okay, this is how she felt about this. This is how she felt about that. And we're just going to write it. So I think it's more a character, character mm-hmm. to character. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of, as you say that, I'm thinking of the, um, we know that Rosie has, she's seen some therapists mm-hmm. over the years. Um, uh, therapy comes up in this book in some really amusing and interesting ways. Yep. Rosie's pretty resistant to the whole thing. It doesn't really do much for her. And I got a sense it was, there was something, it's like she refused to be fixed. She refused to give something up if that's what this was supposed to do for her. Yeah. Whereas on the flip side of it, we see Mivi seek out therapy because she wants to, she wants to be rid of the curse. Mm -hmm. Tell me about introducing this, like bringing in this element of, 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 of talk therapy into this novel. Yeah, I know. I know it can be um, a bit cliche at times. And so I was wary of that, Mm. of using a therapist as a means of relaying a message or getting a character to come to a certain realization. But I did find that it was important to show those two, almost those two approaches that you, that you outlined so well, where you have a character who is so dead set on holding on to what she's lost that she that she can't you know um, like why would you go to a place that you know in theory promises to rid you of it mm. versus Mivi who is at such a vulnerable point in her life um, experiencing that pregnancy and coming face to face with this curse that she really didn't believe in and for her she really needs that outside validation and it's not something that she thinks she can get from 
her friends necessarily, although they do buoy her and they're there to support her. Mm -hmm. For her, I think it's a very factual, scientific, um, you know, pre-med girl. She really believes in the power of um, a professional doctor who might be able to somehow tell her that this curse may or may not be real. And so she's just really banking on that. And I think that therapy session is, is quite transformative for her. A lot of this book takes place in Detroit. The mm-hmm. family takes a trip to, uh, to where they used to live, where they lived when, when they had Vivian, when they lost Vivian. Mm-hmm. Um, and they bring Eddie along. Of course, he, doesn't, he knows nothing of Detroit, really. Um, Detroit's an interesting choice. Tell me about, tell me about their, their journey taking them to Detroit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Detroit was, um, my grandmother was born in Detroit. And she left it um, sort of as the city was really beginning to change and opportunities were were really changing in the the auto industry. Mm -hmm. And to me, the proximity to Toronto facilitated um, just, I suppose, the logistics of the story. And it it just made the most sense to me as, um, as this family sort of immigrating from the United States to Canada. But there's also this, um, you know, more sentimental idea that you have of Detroit as the city that that rose and fell, mm-hmm. and really thinking about the experience that that um, Rosie and Desmond had within the city felt very, felt very. It felt like a mirror of what happened to them, and in the same way that a lot of people fled Detroit. They they did as well when they just couldn't stand to see, you know, things looking the way that they that they had before the loss of their child. They mm-hmm. just couldn't bear to stay any longer, and um, and so they left. The afterpains is dedicated to your daisy chain of women. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell me a, a little bit about the daisy chain of women? Yeah. I think ultimately in writing this story, I realized that, and this this might sound a bit saccharine, but the real um, antidote to not just grief, but loneliness in that grief is connection through community. And I think that so many, so many women, so many mothers find themselves in isolation because they don't admit the uglier truths of their lives, whether that is loss or um, feelings about their roles in their lives, about their identity, how those may have shifted, Mm -hmm. how expectations um, versus reality may not be, may not sit well with them. And I just, I feel so grateful to have the women that I do in my life, the mothers, the mother figures that have inspired this book, um, the female friendships that I do. And yeah, once I got to the end of this book, I, I was just really reminded just how supported I, I felt. And, you know, hopefully it serves as a reminder to, to people to reach out to one another, to check in on people who, you know, are going through tough times and to make yourself vulnerable and say, I'm not dealing with this quite, you know, I'm not dealing with this well, or I'm having feelings about this. Yeah. And I may not like them, but, mm-hmm. you know, I think we're just all a bit lighter when we share some of that with the people around us. Mm-hmm. I understand, I believe, if TikTok didn't lie to me, <laughs> um, you're at work on a second novel. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what it's about because that would be, I can't think of a ruder thing to ask you. Um, but could you tell me how writing it is different from having written The Afterpains? Mm-hmm. It's funny. I had heard from other writers that every book is completely different, um, almost in the same way that I've heard some parents say you have to parent each child differently. Oh, yeah. So it's it's completely different. And I don't think that having written one book has given me much faith in my ability to write another, but I am working on it. And um, I, I really approached the after pains um, as a as a pantser, not a plotter. Mm-hmm. And this time around, I'm plotting things out. Hmm. And it's 
I don't know, maybe just different approaches lend themselves better to different projects. Mm -hmm. I really liked going into the after pains quite blind and exploring, you know, different avenues with different characters, but I'm having fun plotting things out for the second one. Had you wanted to be a plotter? Is that a, is that a type of writer you thought maybe you should be, but then end, ended up a pantser for your first book? What feels natural? I don't know that either one feels natural. Um, I don't even think that either one is a faster approach. I I actually thought that plotting things out would make things go quite quickly because I knew how to get from point A to point B to point mm-hmm. C. Mm-hmm. But of course, um, the story ends up taking you in other directions inevitably. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I think some of my favorite writers um, do both, or you know, switch it up. So I'm just down to keep exploring. Mm-hmm. Anna, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I have been speaking with Anna Julia Stainsby, author of The Afterpains. Find it at Kobo and Conversation's home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. There is a link in the show notes. Subscribe in your podcast player to catch every episode. And if you enjoyed this one, share it with someone you'd tell your deepest secrets to in a supermarket parking lot, in a car, or standing outside one. It's up to you. Kobo in Conversation is produced and hosted this time by me, Nathan Maharaj. Thank you for listening.